Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Miriam Bornhorst. Uh, Miriam is a pediatric neuro-oncologist at Children's National. She did her pediatric and hematology oncology training at the University of Michigan, at which point we were fortunate enough that her PI decided to relocate to Washington uh, to Children's National and brought Miriam with him. Um, so she became our neuro-oncology fellow, um, where she com completed her research work as well. Um, and then she, is a, you'll find quite a polymath in the sense that she's now running our neurofibromatosis program in addition to our cancer genetics program. Um, and somehow, I won't say finds the time, I'll say manufactures the time to pursue her research interests as well in collaboration with a number of labs at Children's National. And so she's going to speak to us today about optical genome mapping, which can reveal novel structural variants in pediatric brain tumors. Thank you for the opportunity to um, come here and speak, and I also just want to say thank you um, to the um, Childhood Cancer Foundation for the, the funding that they've provided to me to do some of this research. Um, so as Dr. Rood mentioned, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about my project on optical genome mapping, um, and this is more of a diagnostic talk, I would say, than um, a therapeutic talk, but in order for us to best manage and treat patients, we also have to be able to diagnose our patients, and so I'm just going to show you how um, we can use this new technology to potentially find some of those um, genomic alterations that are happening in tumors that we otherwise didn't know about. Um, I have no disclosures today. Um, so as many of you here know, pediatric brain tumors are the most common solid tumor that we uh, see in children, um, and it can affect anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 children per year. So there is definitely a need for us to um, be able to diagnose and treat um, these patients. The prognosis really depends on the tumor type, and so for some of these patients, especially the low-grade gliomas, you can have an overall survival of close to 90%. Um, but as, any of, as many of you know, um, there's also tumors like the D um, DIPGs or the diffuse intrinsic ponting tumor. Um, where we still haven't made um, as much progress as we would like, and the overall survival is um, just over zero uh, percent. Um, treatment can include a lot of different things, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, um, and then more recently, molecularly targeted therapy. Uh, so this is really just showing um, a kind of example of some of the um, incorporation of um, structural variants um, into the diagnosis of uh, uh, tumors. And with that, we're also starting to have more therapeutic options. And so um, in the table here, you can see, so there's the tumor type based on the WHO classification, and then the molecular alteration that you see, and then the therapeutic um, um, options that are available for some of these patients. So for example, if you have a low-grade tumor that's diagnosed with a BRAF fusion, now we know that there is a molecularly targeted therapy that can potentially be used to treat that. And so based on this chart here, you can see that there's a BRAF fusion and you might potentially be able to use a MEK inhibitor. Um, so the structural variants are things such as fusions, deletions, duplications, inversion events um, that are large events. So they're not small point mutations. It's not just a letter change. We're talking about a big change within the DNA um, that causes a problem that then makes these tumors grow. Um, and those are actually easier to target at times with therapy than some of the other things. So sometimes it's easier actually to target a fusion, for example, with a MEK inhibitor or with, um, for the NTRAC, for example, with an NTRAC um, inhibitor than um, for some of the point mutations. So optical genome mapping is a, a, a system that's actually been around for a little bit, but it hasn't really been used in tumors. It's mostly been used in constitutional disorders. So FSHD, for example, um, it's been used to diagnose some um, chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and so more um, on the, the blood genetic um, side of things than the tumor side of things. Um, so I have a collaborator um, at Children's National, who some of you uh, met today, who said, let's try this with tumors. And so we decided to try it. Um, so basically with this, what we're doing is we're looking at high molecular weight DNA. So instead of taking the DNA and chopping it up in little pieces and then trying to put it back together again and finding the sequences, we actually leave it as um, long as possible, so as long of a strand as possible. Um, and once we get that high molecular weight DNA, we'll label it with specific sequences. So you take this long strand and you put um, labels along it. So that's the second picture here, um, number two. Um, and then after we've labeled it, then we run it through a machine and the machine goes through and it basically reads all of those different labels. Um, and after it reads them all, uh, puts them into different channels, um, it assembles everything together. So it takes um, all of these long labels and, and puts everything back together into a map. 
Um, and after it puts it back together again, then we can actually see sort of what it looks like. So um, in number seven here, you can actually see what would it be an example of a circus plot or something that shows up showing all of the different structural variants in a tumor. Um, and that again can include anything from deletions, duplications, um, translocation events that can um, uh, cause fusions. Um, and then you can also see um, some of the copy number variations um, on here as well. So we have looked now at 100 different pediatric brain tumor samples. Um, primarily, we've been looking at supratentorial tumors. So we will eventually start to go um, into the, the DIPGs um, and some of the cerebellar tumors, but we've mostly been looking above um, to start with. Um, and this is just kind of a list of some of the tumors that we have looked at so far. And we've also used a number of different types of tumors, so diagnostic, recurrent, and um, uh, postmortem, which are samples that had been uh, donated after a patient passed away. Um, so this is just a, a quick summary of sort of what we see when the, the data comes out. And um, just to kind of show you the, very briefly that the data that we're getting is actually very good data. Um, so we're getting a really good uh, map rate. Um, and then the effective coverage here, our average coverage is just over 500x, which is really great because that means we can actually see um, events down to about a 5% allele fraction, which for um, structural variance is actually pretty low. So it's not common for us to be able to get that low. Um, this is just showing you an example of what we're seeing in terms of the structural variants. And so you can see that there's uh, different types here. The deletions and translocations are um, by far the most common things that we see, which is um, expected based on what is out in the literature. Um, but we also see some duplication events um, and versions um, on here as well. And then this is just sort of showing a chart of some of the genes that, that we see sort of overlapping with our structural variants. And so this is really just a small number of genes. So if it occurred at least twice, I put it on this table, but there's a lot of them that we've seen that have occurred once um, and actually some now a couple more times as we're continuing to, to map more and more samples. Um, but CDCAN 2AB um, loss, of course, is the, the most common. This is something we see fairly commonly. Um, but what I think is really interesting here is that we're actually seeing it in a number of different types of tumors. Um, so I actually have two DIG tumors that had a CDCAN 2AB loss, which I could not find had ever been uh, reported in literature before. Um, and also of those 10 samples, only two of them had actually been reported on clinical reports. And so that means eight of these patients had a, a deletion in this particular gene, which is known to be associated with more aggressive tumor um, without us actually knowing about it when we were treating the patient. Um, the other uh, little stat that I have on here is that many of these tumor samples, so about 45%, had the SV that overlapped with the gene known to be important for tumor genesis. So, so I think this is also important. Um, when we're doing the mapping of our tumors, we're actually finding structural variants that seem to have significance in a, a large number of our samples. Um, so now I'm just going to run through some examples of what we've been seeing and how we found this to be helpful so far. Um, this right here is a patient who had a high-grade glioma that was diagnosed um, actually very young and then recurred, and unfortunately the patient passed away. And so we did optical mapping on the tumor after the patient had passed. Um, at the time the, of diagnosis, it was known that this tumor had a CDCAN 2A, B deletion. So you can sort of see that in the middle here. Um, so there's that big uh, pink area there, and that's just really showing all of the DNA that's been cut out or that's missing. So you have the, um, the reference map that's in the middle there, and then at the bottom it's the sample map. So again, you can see all of that, a lot of that is, is missing there. So you can see the deletion there. But what's really interesting is at the top here, um, there's a kink uh, 1 and track 2 fusion in this patient's tumor. Um, and this is something that we actually did not know about. Um, and so it's a, a fairly small fusion. It has been reported in patients who've had high-grade gliomas before, um, but we, we were not able to find it on any of our other um, sequencing that we had done for this patient. Uh, this is an example of a patient with a low-grade glioma. So this is your classic BRAF KIAA1549 um, um, uh, fusion that you can get in a lot of these low-grade tumors. Um, and you can see, so on the top here, you have um, in the blue, this is actually showing a duplication. Event, um, and so uh, there's there's basically more um, copies than what you're supposed to have. And then the middle of there is that's what's the map supposed to look like. And then at the bottom there, you can see the fusion point. And it's actually quite small. So you'd think that if it was duplicated, 
duplicated multiple times, it should be a lot longer. Um, but the, the map, it's not able to actually show the full duplication in there. So it actually really just shows that fusion event. But you can see the event um, fairly nicely in this. Um, but then what about some of those less common uh, fusions, like this one right here is a patient, again, with a DIG um, that can be associated with BRAF fusions, and you have a um, BRAF CCDC6 um, fusion. So this, again, is not something that we had found on our clinical sequencing, but came up um, pretty easily and um, was easy for us to find on the optical mapping. And so um, it's just another type of uh, fusion. This is not... Um, uh, really super well known, um, but would influence the patient's care uh, should they need any additional treatment for their DIG because this can be targeted with therapy. Um, the other nice thing about, or that I think is really neat about the optical genome mapping is that sometimes you can actually find multiple types of structural variants in one region. Um, so this is an example of a patient who has um, 3X chromosome 11. So there's three copies of the chromosome 11. And this patient also happens to have uh, the C11RF95, which is um, now ZFTA um, Rayla fusion. Uh, but I think what's the most interesting here is that um, there's more than one structural variant event that's happening that's causing this to ha uh, for causing that fusion. So at the top there, where it says DUP, that's actually a duplication event that causes it. On the bottom there, you have a deletion that causes this, and then at the very bottom, you have an inversion that also seems to affect those same genes. And so you've got three different things that are happening, and it's possible you have three separate populations, each one of them having a different event that's causing this particular fusion. Um, um, and we haven't been able to tease this out um, completely yet, but this is something that would be very important because when you are thinking about treating patients, if there are different events or if each cell, um, kind of looking into the heterogeneity of the tumor, if each one has different um, type of an event, um, then we need to know that so that when we're treating this, um, that we're targeting in different ways potentially. Um, the other thing that we found in this sample, which is interesting, this is a dependomoma, is at the bottom there's actually a deletion um, that then resulted in a, a fusion of this NEURL um, and then the SHEPX2 um, a gene. Um, and this, although this really hasn't been um, described before, what you can see here, and this is actually another one of our patients who had a, um, a schwannoma, um, with an LZTR1 germline mutation um, is that you actually have a, a very similar fusion event that can be seen in those particular tumors. Um, and so this, again, is something that was found um, on our optical mapping, not really found in clinical sequencing, um, but did help us to diagnose this patient with a, a germline um, LZTR1 um, schwannomatosis uh, syndrome. Um, another thing that the optical mapping really shows is how uh, again, how complicated tumors can be. Um, and I think that's really the best way to describe this. Um, here you can see this is a patient that has a IDH1 mutant glioma. So it's a patient that's a little on the older side um, that had ATRX loss on the um, pathology IHC, but did not have an um, ATRX mutation. And so we did optical mapping just to see what was going on with the ATRX gene, because we would have expected something to be abnormal. Um, and Again, I'm not 100% sure what exactly is going on here, um, but there's a lot going on around that ATRX gene. Um, there's there's a lot of basically chromothripsis um, is happening here, and so the gene itself or the DNA itself is, is quite um, disrupted in that region um, and really most likely affecting the function of the gene because of that. Um, another important thing, as I mentioned in the, more, uh, the beginning, the, the better coverage we get for this, the lower we can go down in terms of our, our allele fraction. And for some patients, that's actually really important. So this is an NF1 patient that had a um, plexiform neurofibroma that was growing. Um, and it's, it's something where it was concerning enough that I had it surgically removed because I thought that perhaps it was um, kind of becoming more on the malignant side versus on the benign side. And as um, many of you remember from the talk this morning, um, when you progress from a benign neurofibroma to something that's more malignant, you can see specific molecular changes. So we sent it off for sequencing to see if this had any of those molecular changes, um, and it came back negative. In fact, it had nothing in it. There was no NF1 deletion mutation, nothing. Um, so we went ahead and mapped this, um, and you can see this patient um, who does have NF1 does have a, a deletion in the NF1 gene. So that's on the bottom here. You can see the pink there. There's a good chunk of the NF1 gene that's lost, um, and that 
that's really to help explain the NF1 in this patient who had never been clearly diagnosed with that before because all of the sequence in it had always been negative. Um, but what's more important for him is on the top here, you can see um, that there is copy number loss where the CDKN2AB gene is. Um, and so in a low number of cells or in a small number of cells, he does have or he did have that CDKN2AB loss. Um, and so even though we weren't able to see it on the, on the actual sequencing, the tumor that we took out was our, in that sort of transition phase where it went from just NF1 loss only to one that had NF1 loss plus that CDKN2AB deletion. Um, so I went ahead and um, made sure that the entire thing was taken out. Um, and now we're watching very closely uh, to ensure that some of the other tumor that had to be left behind does not grow back because there is a, a definite potential for that. Uh, another way that optical genome mapping has been really interesting, or, um, um, or at least that we found to be interesting, is uh, looking at structural variant changes over time. And so we don't really understand how structural variants change. We do definitely know that when you have a tumor, at first at diagnosis and then you treat it, it changes. The molecular characteristics change. And a lot of the um, uh, studies that we've done on that have really been looking at uh, point mutations or how is it that the mutational profile changes. Um, so one of the things that we're starting to look at is how does structural variant um, profile change over time. And you can see in this particular patient that had a high-grade glioma, the initial primary tumor that's on the left there, um, you can see a few lines here and there, and you can see a few dots in there, but there really wasn't a lot going on in that tumor. It wasn't actually very um, active. But on the, the right side here, you can see now after um, radiation therapy, which is all the patient had gotten for treatment, um, there's a lot of new structural variants. Um, so lots of new events, lots of new um, translocations, um, and also a lot of other um, structural variant events. And some of them are definitely involving genes that are, are known to be important for tumor genesis. And so um, the tumor adapts to some of the therapies, not only with um, new mutations, but also with new structural variants variance. And then this right here is showing um, the differences between what uh, we would consider a more benign tumor and what we would consider a more malignant tumor. And so this on the left-hand side is a cord plexus papilloma. Um, you do see a lot of copy number variations, but you don't really see much else with that. Um, but then on the right, as you get more and more complex in terms of the cord plexus carcinoma, you have more of a complex structural variant profile. Um, and this is just showing a couple, again, genes that are involved in that that are important for tumor genesis. So the last thing I want to show you is the case of a patient um, who came in uh, with a tumor um, that was basically diagnosed as a rhabdoid, rhabdoid um, epithelioid um, embryonal tumor. So we called it an embryonal tumor with rhabdoid features because we didn't really know what else to call it. Um, and we did sequencing on this, and we didn't really ever find anything. So we did optical genome mapping, um, and this is what we found. So there's a, a NUT-M1 ZNF532 gene fusion, um, and this is something that actually had um, never been described in a pediatric patient before. Um, but when you, or sorry, this is on optical mapping, we did confirm this on um, genome sequencing as well. Um, but when you look through, you'll actually see that this fusion has been described in adult cancers before. Um, and most of those cancers actually had a pathology or histology that was very similar to our patient. And so um, even though the location of these tumors is different, um, so on here you can see the locations are um, anywhere from the lung, pelvic bone, mandible, parotid gland, um, with our patient they had a similar tumor in the brain. Um, and we also look to see then, so is it really the, the ZNF532 that's more important or the NUT-M1? And it probably is the NUT-M1 um, that is the more important driver of that particular fusion. Um, and there are some NUT-M1 uh, fusion tumors in pediatric patients, brain um, tumor patients, um, that also have somewhat um, similar pathology. And this is just, we searched the literature and this is just a list of what we found. Um, so from what we saw in this patient, this really could, in theory, be a new diagnostic entity or something that you could um, you know, add to your WHO classification um, where you can get these NUT-M1 fused uh, tumors. And I think it's going to be important for us to pull these aside and look at them differently in terms of treatment because they don't seem to uh, respond to treatment the same as some of the other patients. Um, and so it's, it's something else that we were able to find with our optical mapping that was really interesting. So in conclusion, the optical genome mapping that we did of the pediatric tumors is um, definitely an effective method for identification of clinically relevant structural variants. We can see low allele fraction structural variants and other structural variants that really weren't identified through other clinical sequencing methods. Um, 
It's a, a method that can be used um, basically to map uh, different types of brain tumor types. Um, and then also it really can help define the heterogeneity of the tumors. And so what we're doing now is we're moving into um, looking at additional tumors or trying to expand our tumor types so that we can um, really get the structural variant profile of that, but then also adding that to some of the other uh, genome sequencing data, RNA sequencing data, to see if we can really get a comprehensive um, analysis of what these tumors look like. Um, another thing that we're going to be adding uh, to this shortly, and this is um, actually part of what the Children's um, Cancer Foundation is funding for me, is um, the addition of methylation. And so we are able to do dual label optical mapping now where we can look at both structural variation and the methylation in the same sample and on the same DNA, um, which is going to be really exciting. And hopefully next year I'll have a, a poster or talk about that. So. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, Hike Bersingen, who's here today, um, who's really been one of the, the key people who's helped me with this project, um, has a lot of experience in optical mapping and has taught me really everything that I, I have learned. And then um, you can also see the rest of my team on here. Um, they've all been really helpful in terms of um, helping with this project. And then, of course, the funding sources, which includes the Children's Cancer Foundation, but some other um, funding sources as well. Thank you. I think I went short on time, so I'm not sure if there's... <laughs> Questions? It's really great talking, cool technology. So the, um, do you do a matched germline with every tumor sample? Is that how you sort of normalize to make sure you're not... Picking up something from the germline? That's my yeah. first question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we haven't been able to get matched for every tumor sample, but we're trying to as many as possible. So of the 100 that we've done so far, about half of them have had matched and about half of them have not. But there is a normal sort of um, database that we will filter against. It's just that it's not as robust, obviously, as some of the other databases that are out there because this is such a new technology. So we have we are going to work on building that database so that we have a, a better way to filter out those normal ones. And I guess my second question is: Is what's the resolution of how small of a event you can see? Can you see a you know a couple base pair deletion, or how big does it have to be? So about 500 base pairs would probably be, yeah. Okay. A good resolution. Thank you. Other questions? Um, small piece of trivia. Your <laughs> slide with the um, different uh, uh, nut M1 fusions on it. You know, uh -huh. the paper co blah, 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 authors. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's my patient. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So we have a cell line in the freezer if you want to study it. Oh, I'd love to. Okay. We'll have to talk. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's great. All right. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you.